So last Sunday, we talked about understanding the fear of the Lord. Understanding the fear of the Lord. So, are we to have a fear of, are we to be afraid of God? Well, if you're lost, you should. If you're a child of God, you're to honor Him, you're to respect Him, you're to defer to him and so it's probably always helpful by definition to think of or or it's always helpful to define things the fear of the lord well think of awe think of reverence but it's not just awe and reverence but i'm still doing my own thing the fear of the lord is what causes you to want to obey the lord it causes you intuitively to know, I need to do what's right, okay? So when I talk about understanding the fear of the Lord, some people say, well, Pastor Tom, the thing that attracts me to your ministry is you talk about the goodness of God, and you talk about the favor of God, and you talk about the mercy of God, and you're talking about the fear of the Lord here. How does all that mesh? How does all that work together? Well, you see, the Bible covers more than one topic. The Bible doesn't just teach one side of things, but the Bible gives us what we refer to as the whole counsel of God. For example, the Bible doesn't just teach heaven. The Bible teaches what? The Bible teaches hell, right? So the Bible doesn't just teach about um, the the blessings of faith, but the Bible also teaches about Jesus, post-resurrection, went to the disciples, and the Bible says he upbraided them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Now, this is post-resurrection. This is the dispensation that we're living in now, the church age. And he looked at him, and he said, you know, he upbraided them for their unbelief. So I want to read this scripture from Isaiah. We read it last week, but it'll help us to see that Jesus, while he was on the earth, he walked in the fear of the Lord. Notice It says here, this is a messianic passage. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. In other words, a remnant, a descendant from the lineage of Jesse. Jesse being David's father. And a branch from the roots, from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, notice this phrase about Jesus. We're talking about our Savior here. The Bible says here about our Savior, in his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall judge by what his eyes see and decide disputes by what his ears hear. So I realize it's not on the screen, but it's in the Bible, okay? So Isaiah chapter number 11, verse number 3, talks about Jesus. He delighted in the fear of the Lord. Now question, do you delight in the fear of the Lord? Do you have a a healthy understanding of the fear of the Lord? Well, if you do, well then that's, that's a good thing because that's the way Jesus lived his life. He lived his life in a healthy understanding of the fear of the Lord. And then when Jesus is on the earth, we read this last week, but notice this. Jesus talked about the importance of people fearing the Lord. Now, we live in a society right now where I can't tell you that the mainstream media, I can't tell you that Hollywood is living with the fear of the Lord right now. I can't tell you that when cultures redefine the definition of marriage that they're living in the light of the fear of the Lord. Does that make sense? You know, we just need to pray that nothing ever happens to our nation's capital. Because, see, we could never rebuild the nation's capital the way it's built today. Because if you've ever been in the nation's capital, you'll know there's just just one scripture after another scripture after another scripture after another scripture. It's just all over the place. There's references to God and there's scriptures or there are inferences about our nation being birthed by God. You see, if we were to rebuild the capital now, you know what would happen? They would scrub all that stuff. They'd say, well, you know, we did this. By the might of our hand, we pulled it off. 
Well, so we would say it this way. At one time, even in the, our nation, there was a greater fear or reverence or awe or respect for God than exists today in America. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, there was a time that people had a respect for God in a way that you don't see it today. And now Jesus said this in John, or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 10. Now remember, this is God in the flesh. This is the personification of the goodness of God. And he says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. In what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him. He's talking about his father who is able to, who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. So Jesus, when he was on the earth, he told people, you better have awe and respect towards God. You need to have a reverential awe towards the Lord. You need to be obedient to the Lord, careful obedience to the Lord. Now, if I were going to describe the fear of the Lord, it means that you are seeking to honor God with your life to the extent that you're more interested in honoring God than you are people, right? In other words, you're more interested in the praise of God than you are the praise of man. Now, you know why most pastors don't want to preach on stuff like this? Is because, you see, you teach on certain things in the Bible, and there's no pushback. But you teach on the whole counsel of God. Some of these things, like I said, the scriptures that aren't underlined in your Bible, they're just as inspired as the ones that are underlined in your Bible. And certainly we need to rightly divide the Word of God, and we need to realize that the Old Testament is subordinate to the New Testament. So we're living in a new covenant. We're not, not living under the Old Covenant, and all the Old Testament is subordinate to the New Covenant. But yet the New Covenant has something to say about the importance of us living in the fear of the Lord. Now, it'll affect a person's life. It'll affect their, for the positive and the negative. Now, do I think Jesus, who delighted in the fear of the Lord, do I think he was afraid of his heavenly Father? No, I don't. But do I think he was consumed with honoring the name of God, honoring the Lord in everything he did? Yes, I do believe that. And do I believe that each one of us should have a, just a consuming desire to say, Lord, I want to honor you in whatever I do, wherever I go, I want to represent you well. If that's your heart, guess what? That's the fear of the Lord. Now, we read about Jesus while he was on the earth. The Bible says, In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, notice this, he was heard because of his godly fear. Now, what is that? Jesus, though he was... God in the flesh, he was Emmanuel, is Emmanuel, God is with us. But yet while he was on the earth, what happens? He was heard because he had a reverential awe of his father. You know, I'm not trying to take you beyond scripture. I'm just wanting you to sync you up with the Bible. I'm just wanting you to make sure that you're not scrubbing away anything that is sacred. See, we live in a society today and they don't, there's no emphasis placed on honor. Does that make sense? I mean, if you go somewhere in mass transportation, you go somewhere and, um, you know, it used to be if you see an, a lady or you see an older person come in, you know, the younger generation would defer to the older generation and give them the seat. Yes. Well, you know, nowadays they're just going to call the older generation, come on, old man. I mean, no, there's a better way than referring. They were called elders in the Bible, and they're called old men and, you know, in a deferring, in a, a, a derogatory way in the culture that we're living in. Y'all, if we can give God our best, guess what? You're going to see his best. And why, how do you find that? I find it in 1 Samuel 2 and 30. Those that honor me, I will honor them. You say, well, Pastor, I honored the Lord when I invited his son Jesus into my life. That's true. But you also realize in the book of Acts, there were times that they walked after, the, after the, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. The Bible says there was great fear among the church. I mean, they recognized, look, we need to make sure that we're 
honoring the Lord and that we, how we live our lives. Now, it's a, it's a deep sense of awe, a deep sense of reverence. It's a submissive attitude. See, we don't have that attitude today. We live in a culture where people go to work for somebody for one week, and after one week, they think they know as much as the person who's been doing their job for 30 years. Give me an amen here. We, we live in a situation where people just feel like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? We're all equal here. You know, we're all equal in terms of value. We're all equal in terms of importance. But the scripture does talk about give honor to whom honor is due. And so what happens when a society really doesn't honor God, they no longer honor certain people. You know, we refer to judge your honor, the honorable person, talking about certain people in politics. See, I honor the office, even if I can't necessarily honor the way the person who possesses that office is living their life at that time. And we need to remember that living in the fear of the Lord, it's not as though, well, I honor God, but bless God, there's nobody else I'm going to honor. No, you're gonna, if you're going to do it God's way, you're going to give honor to whom honor is due. You're going to respect certain people. You're going to respect your parents, aging parents. You're going to respect uh, people. You're just going to give honor to whom honor is due. So, the fear of the Lord is a respect and all reverence to the Lord to the extent that you want to walk in obedience to his word and you want to follow his promptings. Now, we talked last week about what the fear of the Lord is not. The fear of the Lord is not a demonic thing. For example, the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. The fear of the Lord here is not a tormenting thing where the Bible says there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Therefore, fear, or fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's not what we're talking about. A tormenting fear. But it's a healthy thing. There's a healthy thing. Can I get an amen here? Amen. You know, this fellow that was doing the awning here at the church, I talked to him, he's a Hispanic guy, and I brought him in my office the other day, and I thought, well, he's kind of captive, I've got him in my office, so I might as well preach to him, right? So I began to talk to him, and I said, man, there's a heaven, there's a hell, and I, and I said, do you go to church? No, I, I just work, and he's a good guy, and I said, well, and I looked at him, I said, you know, the Bible teaches there's heaven, but the Bible teaches there's hell, and I said, if the battery has a positive on it, the battery's also got a, he goes, a negative on it. And, uh, you know, we eventually talked, and, and, and it's funny, the longer we went, he stopped me. He says, you know, I think I remember praying this prayer one time in a Baptist church. <laughs> I said, well, let's pray it again. Now, I'm not talking about a tormenting fear, but I'm talking about a sense of respect, okay? Now, it's important that we do that. And then the other thing is Jesus... He dealt with this while he was on the earth. There was a lot of people, the Bible says, for example, in John chapter 12, they love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. Amen. So what is that? It's when people are more conscious of man's approval than God's approval. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. You say, Pastor Tom, I don't like you. You know, it's more important that God likes what I do and how I'm honoring him than it is any approval of man. Now, here's what happened. Y'all know most of you are familiar with Martin Luther. If you've ever studied about his life, about 500 years, actually 500 years ago, what took place was the Reformation. In the Reformation, Martin Luther was so disgusted with the church structure at that day, and he said, you know, it's not, we're not justified by works. We're justified by grace alone. And so the Reformation, he reformed really so many lives through this revelation. But what happened with Martin Luther is, if you'll study about his life, he got to the point where we came across the book of James, where James talks about faith without works is dead, that Martin Luther just said, well, I don't even think the book of James should be in the canon of Scripture. In other words, he was so emphatic and so certain that we're not saved by our works, but we're saved by grace alone, that whenever he came across people that believed that faith has deeds, or faith has corresponding actions, to him that was an affront. And so he got to the point where he just wanted to annex the book of James from the canon of Scripture. 
And so what some people can do is they can hear so much about the goodness of God that they feel like, well, I'm kind of taken back that you would even talk about the fear of the Lord. Well, y'all, you're going to have to erase about 300 scriptures out of the Bible, okay? And I'm talking about New Testament passages. I'm not just referring to what's said in the Old. And, of course, we will interpret the Old through the lens of the New. And we'll see. Now, I didn't read this scripture last week, but I want you to notice Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice this. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So what we would say is, is God was working in such a way that it was like, wow, this is sovereign. This is amazing. This is like in awe, right? And, and I'll tell you, really, do we have enough services where there are signs and wonders, there's the supernatural, there's God is working in such a way that you are in awe? To where you know, man didn't pull this off, this was a God deal, right? Do you realize, y'all, we can, we can orchestrate things, we can do everything, we can have excellence, we can have it done well, but, y'all, there's no substitute for the anointing of the Holy Spirit in a service. So I'll tell you this little story. It comes to my mind right now. So, you know, my parents were in a denominational church, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we eventually ended up in this very small, spirit-filled church, and it just had two sections of seats, okay? So it couldn't have seated more than maybe 150 people. It was just two sections of seats. And, and on a Sunday night, I was in church, and there was a lady sitting on this side. I'm sitting on the back row of this section, but there's a lady sitting right over here on this west section of that church. And she, she got up, and she had a, a, what we know as an, a message in tongues, Okay? And then the interpretation followed, and the interpretation was this. Yes, many have come forward, and at that night, a lot of young people had come up to the front and were seeking the Lord. And she's looking dead ahead. You know, she was looking straight ahead. She goes, yes, but there is still one. <laughs> and this is what, in my mind, this is what I was thinking whenever all this was going on. Lord, you know my heart, I try so desperately but I'm just, I just keep messing up. And she said, and you have said, I'm too bad. I remember that. She said that. But the Lord, you know, I don't remember the, the rest of it, but I remember that part. But there's still one, and you have said you're too bad. And, of course, I thought, okay, first of all, we're down to one process of elimination here and then I remember going down you know I'm still talking about that experience all these years later why to me that was an awe of God without a doubt that was the Lord Amen. and see that's what the purpose of tongues with interpretation equals prophecy and that's what Paul said when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in manifestation men will be in awe and they will say of a truth God is in you so what we need is we need to have services that are not just orchestrated by man, but we need services that are orchestrated by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've got another illustration that's coming to my mind, so I take it as the Lord and I flow with it, right? One time we had a lady here, and, and, and she ministered on a Sunday night. And there wasn't a lot of people here, but there was one lady in the church that encouraged her son to come to church and he never went to church he was unsaved she was standing right up here she's ministering she's very eccentric personality and she just stops right here walks off the platform walks over to where he was sitting i can still remember in this section right here looks at him and says don't you want to know the lord don't you want to serve the lord and then 
you know, he kind of looked at her like not in a real pleasant way, but she had a real pleasant way about her. And then finally she took him by the hand. She brought him right up here, stood right here. And she looked at him and said, don't you want to serve the Lord? God is showing me. He's got a plan for your life. I even see in my spirit. She moved in the gifts in an amazing way. She said, I see God has ministry for you. He has people he wants to reach you with. And she began to minister to him. And I was standing right here. And you know what he said? He said, no. And then he said this, and you can't make me. I'm sitting right here on the front row as a pastor. How many know that's when you want to go clean up on aisle four, right? <laughs> and I'm like going, oh, my Lord. He said that to her. And she goes, well, I just want you to know, my heart, I'm just drawn to you. I'm just drawn to you. So he went and sat down, and the service is over. And she came back into my office, and she said, Pastor Tom, her and her husband, I am so sorry, but I just felt like a magnet drawn me to that young man. And I've never done anything like that before, but I know that was, I felt anyway, it was the Lord. I would say it was maybe three to four months later, maybe six months later, the mother that brought that young man to church called me and she was in tears. It was early one morning and she said, Pastor Tom, could I get the CD of that service she said, my son died last night of a drug overdose. And that was really the last time he was in church. And that was the last time the gospel was presented to him. And she said, you know, she was crying. She said, maybe there was something in there. I don't remember all that she said. but I, And I said, well, certainly we can do what we can to get you the CD of that. But you know, when I thought of that, that's whenever there's an awe in church. That's when there's a healthy respect in church to where people recognize, wow, God's in here. God is moving. And you see, the Bible talks about in the book of Acts, every time there were signs and wonders, the Bible says, and there was great fear among the church, or there was great awe among the church. And you go to the book of Acts, and you'll see that they walked in a healthy fear of the Lord, a reverential awe of the Lord. Correct? Acts chapter 9 and verse number 31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, we see this as a reoccurring theme because I think sometimes people will say, well, I understand that's a real dominant thought in the Old Testament. Is that something that's reiterated in the New Testament? And the thing that you'll see in Scripture is how many times throughout the book of Acts, I'm not going to read them all today like we did last week, but it is a reoccurring theme that the early church walked in a healthy fear of the Lord. What do you think happened whenever Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves and there was a great calm? After that, the disciples were in awe. Whoa, that's really something. Look at that. And I think whenever God moves in a powerful way, all of us can be in awe. Look what the Lord has done. It's interesting because in the book of Acts, you also see there was great rejoicing in that city in Acts chapter 8. But then sometimes you read about when the power of God came and the people, there was great fear among the people, awe among the people. Not afraid of God like you're afraid of somebody who's out to get you, but a sense of reverential awe. Now, one of the things that the fear of the Lord will do in our lives, it will motivate us to live honorable lives, holy lives, it will motivate us to do what's right because it makes us keenly aware of the fact God is omnipresent. God is everywhere all the time. God sees what's going on. Let me tell you, you can fake out your parents, you can fake out a boss, but you're never going to fake out God. You know, well, I, I pulled the wool over their eyes. Well, you're not going to pull the wool over God's eyes. 
And so you're going to have to realize that God sees what's going on. You say, Pastor, I'm a believer. I'm a child of God. Do you think I can live a willfully disobedient a life to God, willfully turn my back on what I know is the revealed will of God through Scripture and still have all the blessings of God? Well, I think Paul addressed that when he said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to your flesh, of your flesh you're going to reap corruption. He's talking to believers. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. And so, you know, you can't keep sowing to the carnal nature and reaping the rewards that you really want out of life. So we need to honor God in obedience. If you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, we read this in Romans chapter 3 when the Apostle Paul was making reference to Rome. And he spoke here in verse number 10, and we didn't read the full passage of this last week. I'm going to read to you here. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10, it says, as it is written. So anytime you see in the new covenant, as it is written, he's making reference to an old covenant passage. And it says this, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have turned aside they have together become unprofitable there is none who does good no not one their throat is an open tomb with their tongues they practice deceit the poison of asp is in their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness their feet are swift to shed blood destruction and misery are in their ways in the way of peace they have not known. And then notice verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, do you understand? We could, we could say in our culture today, of course, he's referring to the unregenerate society, the Romans then. He's looking at all of them and saying, this is the characteristics. Y'all, how many know we can say, well, they're doing this or they're doing that or they're acting this way or they're acting out this way or they're not? Or we could just summarize it by saying, the reason why they do what they do is there is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't honor God. So there is a parallel that we could reverse this passage and we could say when there is the fear of the Lord, people become righteous and they walk in that righteousness and, and we could just take all of these characteristics and invert them and that's exactly what happens whenever people do walk with the fear of the Lord. You know, they don't want to say, in God we trust on the money, right? They say, well, you know, in God we trust. That's kind of an offensive statement to some. You see, humanism never wants to elevate something above you. Humanism has a way of lowering God and deifying man. And we've got to watch that spirit can get in the church. And I think what we can do is we kind of feel like, well, you know, I kind of can do what I want to do. You know, you need to make sure you're doing, don't define the way I see God. That's the problem. You've heard that. Now, the way I see God, how many know I'll never be counted in judgment and I'm never going to be able to float that one by the Lord? Now, the Lord, the way I see it is this. How I many know he could care less what you think? I mean, in your own opinion, everybody's got an opinion. It doesn't really matter. You know what's going to matter? Heaven and earth's going to pass away one day, but this word's never going to pass away. And so we're going to live our life in the reverential fear of the Lord. We talked about this passage in Ephesians chapter 5. What causes marriages to work? Or we could flip it around the other way. What happens when marriages don't work? They don't fear the Lord. Right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21 says this, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. So how do I honor God? I submit to the Lord, but in also it'll create a submissive attitude in marriage and other people. When people have a healthy dose of an awe and a reverence, and a desire to obey God, you know what will happen? They will submit in a proper way. 
I'm going to tell you why 99% of all the problems that take place in this world exist. It's called selfishness. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. We could fix the world's problems, so many of the world's problems, if we could just get everybody to love. Go home today and love the people that live in your neighborhood just as much as you love yourself. And then get the person next door doing that and get the person two doors down, three doors down, four doors down. You just get everybody walking in love. But you see, we don't want to serve one another, submit to one another. But notice in marriage, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, how many know that scripture doesn't read? Husbands, change your wives. Amen. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So, the foundation of a good marriage is people walking in the fear of the Lord. Now, when I officiate a wedding ceremony, you know, usually when we exchange rings, I will say, now these rings are going to be with you always, and they are to be a ceaseless reminder of the covenant that you're making, not only between one another, but primarily before God. And just as the circle is unending, may it remind you of the unending love that should exist between the husband and the wife in marriage. Now, I say that, and I've said that for many years, but... These rings are to be with you to be a ceaseless reminder of the covenant that you are making, not only between one another, but primarily before God. So what does the ring do? It reminds you of a covenant that you've made. You see, when we live in the fear of the Lord, it's like, hey, I need to treat that person right. Correct? I'm, I'm, I tell you this this. All this noise is distracting me this morning, right? You know, in other words, what causes people? I'll put it this way. If you're, if you're single and you're looking for somebody to marry, do not marry somebody who doesn't have the fear of the Lord in their life. Amen. Okay? Oh, they'll change. They told me, Pastor, when we get married, they'll change. Right? Don't believe that. Y'all, if they don't honor God before they met you, is there any guarantee they're going to honor God after they met you? And so the healthiest thing you can find in a marriage is, does this person honor God? Because see, if they honor God, they're going to honor their marriage vows. They're going to honor their spouse. They're going to, I've discovered this. Have you noticed when this gets right, this starts getting right too? In other words, when you get the vertical right, it's amazing how the vertical starts affecting the horizontal. And whenever we get things spiritually right in our life, there is a healthiness. So there's a balance in Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 28, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. Reverence and godly fear. You know, just dropping back to the comment about marriage. I tell Sharon sometimes, you know, Sharon, I, I want to be faithful. I want to be honorable in every way to you. But I want to tell you, and I'm not saying this arrogantly or sarcastically, but Sharon, before you ever came around, I was honoring God. Before we ever dated, I walked in a a fear of the Lord. In other words, you know, it's not as though, oh, now that I'm married, I need to get my act together. No, y'all, how many know we need, to, we need to just, it takes two healthy people to make a healthy marriage. Amen. Right? And don't marry a project. Give me a good amen. Oh, well, they're a little fixer-upper. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip them. No, you're going to get flipped. Isn't it funny when I digress from notes, all the stuff that comes out of here, you know? <laughs> don't marry a project. Oh, pastor, they don't have any fear of God right now, but they told me if we get married, they'll start going to church. They told me, if, if they told me that we could, they told me that, y'all, if they're not honoring God right now, 
here's my advice to single people. Take off running after Jesus. Run as fast as you can to follow the will of God for your life. And if you look over and you see somebody running by your side, that might be the person God has for you. In other words, you just focus on him and, and other things will be added unto you. This is Senior Sunday. It might be Singles Sunday as well, right? But I just want to give you some helpful thoughts. I mean, y'all, if they're not, if they're... Okay, who hires people? Oh, they have a heart. They got a resume. They quit, they quit this. They stole from them. They did this. They stirred up strife here. They did all this. But they said if they come work for me, they, they're going to quit that stuff. Well, why don't you let them build up their resume a little more before they come to work for you a little bit. And so, you know, I believe in people turn around. I believe people change, but also believe that John the Baptist gave us a good word of advice. Let people bring forth fruit of repentance. Let us see some evidence that there is change. Let them get, build their confidence in life. All right. At least I'm having fun doing it, all right? I mean, some... I'm, Okay, let's, let's talk about this one. How about this one? 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Are those not great bullet points? Honor all people. Well, they're lost. Honor them. Well, they're serving me. Well, let me tell you, your little track at the end of your lunch, it going to mean a lot. If you were like rude and crude and dishonoring all through the lunch, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Hold on to the track. But you need to honor people. You know, people get in ministry. Oh, I tell you, you know, and they, they go in and they're rude to everybody. But when I get in the pulpit, I'm going to switch on, turn the switch on. Well, let me tell you, y'all, ministry is at the airport. It's at the restaurant. It's in the cab. It's wherever you go. That's where ministry takes place. Okay. Honor or love the brotherhood. Well, they don't believe the way I believe. Are they born again? Oh, yeah, they're born again. They're in the family, okay? Amen. Fear God. Reverence God. And in an interesting where it says, fear God above, honor the king. And that's the order. It says, well, pastor, the Supreme Court said this. Did you know the Supreme Court's missed it a time or two? It wasn't too long ago that they, they missed it on other stuff. Let me tell you, God doesn't miss it. Amen. Never has, never will. So we fear God. We, we want to go ahead and put the Lord first. And we want to fear God. Now, fearing God is something you do all the time everywhere. Reverence for God. I want to do what's right. Can I tell you a little funny story? Uh, it's another one that comes to my mind. So, you know, if they come to my mind, I, I try to run them through a filter, but that filter gets wider the older I get, all right? One time I had a guy here, and we had a problem with a, I don't know how to describe this. It would have been an insurance claim on property damage. And I had a friend of mine, he's, a, he's, a, he's very good at fighting these claims, and he has a background where part of his job, that's what he does. Nobody in this church, but this is somebody that I know, has an engineering background. And he came to me and he said, hey, I, I can get a claim on that. I do it all the time. He started pushing me, you know, hey, we can do this. I'll, I'm not even going to fill it. I didn't ask him to do anything. He filled out all this, had this real technical letter, you know, written out. And says, I, we, can, we can push this thing. We can get you a claim. You know, he's pushing me on it. And I was in my office one day. I'm telling you, I was in my office one day. I had that piece of paper in front of me, and I heard the Lord say, fraudulent. Now, how many know God can bless us, with us without us being fraudulent? How many believe that? Amen. Oh, Pastor, I'm involved in this deal, and it's going to make us all multimillionaires. Now, it's going to bankrupt a few people along the way, but it won't hurt us, Pastor Tom. Did you know Jesus is the one who invented win-win? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But I always remember that. I was in my office and it was like, as soon as I heard that, it just like you took a, 
a plug and unplug something. I mean, it was like all the power went out. I thought, there's no point in me pursuing this. I know what the word of the Lord is on this deal. You see, here's the deal, y'all. The Bible is the logos, the word of God, the totality of the revelation of God. But out of the logos, out of the word of God, totality of scripture, in your time of need, God will give you a word from the word. And when you get a word from the word, that's what we refer to as a spoken word or a rhema word. And it's whenever you hear God speaking to you. And when you're making important decisions in our life, part of the fear of the Lord is, Lord, I know what the totality of Scripture says, but Lord, I need a word from your word. And a word from your word means a rhema word. And I'm going to walk in the light of what you tell me to do, independent of what other people think. So, y'all, faith begins when the will of God is known. If you don't have any Bible for what you're believing, you're out on your own. And if the Holy Spirit's prompting you to go in a different way, you need not to try to change God. You just need to make a change on your own and say, Lord, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to live my life. Now, it's funny. I've got a whole nother 10 pages of notes that is part B, but I haven't got to the first one, but I'm not going to, like I say, I'm not going to keep you past three. So here we go. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to hit on a few of these this morning. I said it last week, understanding the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord isn't a bondage. Does that make sense? Amen. Now it can be a bondage. You know, there are some church traditions where there's a tremendous amount of reverence in the building, which I think reverence is important. But there can be reverence that's in a negative way instead of in a healthy way. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse number 6, the last portion of that verse says, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now, if most people, if, if, if somebody came to you and said, hey, I've got a treasure from heaven, most of you say, I'm, a, I'm all in. And then they said, it's the fear of the Lord. You know, most people go, oh, brother, that's going to be heavy. That's going to be trying to restrict me, hem me in. See, God's commandments are given to protect us. God's commandments are given to help us to stay in the right path. So notice this, the fear of the Lord is a treasure. So you need to be thankful that you have a healthy fear of the Lord in your life. Because as far as, not everybody has that, and as far as God is concerned, that's a treasure from heaven. Correct? Yes. I remember one time, you know, my mother used to make this comment about me. Now, she tells me, there was three of us kids, okay? I was the youngest. And she'd say, now, Tom, you got more whoopings. Y'all know what whoopings are? <laughs> okay, you got to be a little... If you're in the South, you know what a whooping is. And so I, got, I used to say, Tom, you got more whoopings than all of them. I mean, she said more than any of them. I mean, combined, you got more whoopings than all of them. And she'd make that statement about me. And she'd still make that statement. But she'll say, Tom, you know what was different about you? She made this statement. My mother's still alive. She said this. But Tom, you're always quick to repent. If you ever did something wrong, you're always a quick to say, hey, look, forgive me, I messed up, I want to do what's right. You know, that's good for all of us when you have the fear of the Lord. You're not trying to string it out. I mean, I got awed against this person. How many weeks can I turn this offense into? You know, when you have the fear of the Lord, you know what you're doing? You're just submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Say, Lord, I just forgive them right now in Jesus' name. Well, they don't deserve forgiveness. You think when Jesus is on the cross and he said, Lord, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. You think Jesus said, they don't even deserve it, Jesus. You think when Stephen was being stoned and he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge that Stephen was saying. And, and they're, they're just knuckleheads for doing what they're doing. He didn't say that. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. So we need to have a forgiving spirit. And a forgiving spirit is in the heart of people to have a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord. Y'all, we all want to receive it, but if you're going to be a recipient of it, you need to be a person that gives it out. 
Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. I mean, Lord, you've been so good to me. I want to bless other people. I want them to know the goodness of the Lord. Amen? Oh, I tell you, I'm not going to read all these, but I'm going to read a couple of them, all right? Psalm 34, 11 says this. Come, you children, listen to me. And notice this passage. This is Psalm 34, 11. It says, I will teach you the fear of of the Lord. You know, we need to teach our children to fear or reverence in a healthy way God. We need to teach a generation to have a healthy respect for God. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, you got people, we, we, we got schools where it's okay, it's okay. We need to teach them the tornado drill because they need to fear a tornado. Well, y'all, if, you, if you're teaching them to fear a tornado, yeah, that's an unhealthy fear, a fear that can go crazy on people. But let me tell you, what about just teaching the children and how do you honor God? How do you do what's right, not only in the sight of man, but primarily in the sight of God? And I'm telling you, y'all, there's people that they've had high fives by man but they were not in the will of God. And you can get approval of man, and you can be disapproved of God. Paul said, if I sought the approval of man, I would not be a servant of the Lord. That's his summary of ministry. Somebody said, if you want to make people happy, hear this. You want to make people happy? Sell ice cream. But oh, I, I tell you, sometimes in ministry, you're not always going to make, you know, people don't want to hear if you don't work, you won't eat. They, don't, they, they want to hear Jesus, you know, uh, fed the multitudes, and he did. But the same Bible that talks about feeding the multitudes also talks about, you know, you need to be diligent. You need to be a, a person that honors your word. You need to have a person that is a, have work ethic in your life. So the Bible says we need to teach the fear of the Lord. And I tell you this, it's impossible for people to say, oh, I have the fear of the Lord, but I, te I treat people like they're trash. That doesn't work. Because let me tell you why. Those people are made in the image of God. And we need to honor people. We need to treat people in a right way. Because those people are the very ones sometimes, you, you never know who's God's got in your future, Right? And when you burn a lot of bridges, you might need one of those bridges one day. So be careful there. But can I tell you, my? I, I, there's a lot of good ones in here, but I have to tell you one of my all-time favorites is this Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 4. Proverbs 22, 4 says this, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and what? By humility in the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and what? Life. I could summarize, summarize it this way. Pretty much everything you're really wanting out of life is found by humility in the fear of the Lord. In other words, you're not, you're not going to go down. You're not going to go down. I told my boys this. Somebody came in my office to visit with me on this week, and this person is right at 80 years of age. And uh, I don't even know for sure if this person was raised in a church family as a young person. But they're going through a difficult time in their life. And I got my Bible off the shelf, and I said, Listen, I'd like to read a scripture to you. And when I opened my Bible to start to read a scripture to them, they took their hat off their head. And I know you say, well, that's a cultural thing. I understand that. But in their mind, and then when I pray for them, you know, they wanted to make sure there was an honor. Now you say, Pastor, I don't want to get locked up in a lot of traditions of men. I get all that. But how many know, y'all, we can also go clear the other way to where there is no sacredness about anything. If you learn anything from the Old Covenant, and that our God is a holy God, and you see it repeated in 1 Peter chapter. One in verse number 16, be holy because our God is holy. Talking to believers, walking it out. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, 
honor in life. Oh, I got to, yeah, I have good news. I'm getting now to page one of my new notes, okay? <laughs> Oh, it's somebody said it's her. Thank you, Marlon. I don't need a lot of encouragement here. <laughs> By nature, man can be resentful to the honor of the Lord. I'll just say this. How did, how did Solomon summarize his whole life? He summarized his whole life by saying, this is the whole duty of man. You need to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This is what you need to focus on. Wow, I didn't realize I'd gone as long as I had. Here's what I want to get across to everybody here today. Yes, you are a child of God. Yes, you're in the kingdom of God. But as a child, just like you can grow in grace, you can grow in knowledge, you can grow in wisdom. The Bible says about John the Baptist, it says about Jesus, they grew in wisdom and in nurture and what? And in the fear of the Lord. There was a, a development in honoring God. So what do we want to do? All of us, collectively. We want to honor God. And you say, how is that expressed? How is that manifested? Well, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But here's another way it's expressed and manifested. When you really find people that honor God, you'll discover those people honor the creation of God. People that God's created in his own image. In other words, you know, you realize everybody's important. I was talking to our boys on the way to church this morning, and we were talking about somebody that was making poor choices in their life. But I used the illustration. I said, look, if you had a $100 bill and it was crisp, it was clean, it was straight out of the mint. I mean, it's like squeaky clean, brand new $100 bill. And you had another $100 bill. This one's wadded up. This one's kind of all matted up. It's kind of dirty. Did you know the crispy clean one isn't worth any more than the wrinkled one. And I'll say this, sometimes we see people and they've got their act together and we think, oh, that person is, is, is valuable to God. Well, they are valuable to God. But let me tell you, whether they're up and out or whether they're down and out, God loves them all. Amen. He does. Now, I understand some people are more valuable to the kingdom and some people use their life in such a way to further the kingdom and that we understand that. But y'all, we need to choose to be a vessel of honor. But here's this. Y'all, whether the $100 bill is crisp and clean or whether it's wrinkled up, and you know, we live in a society, if you get a little wrinkled up, people don't honor like they should. But the fact of the matter is we ought to honor them more. We ought to honor... People, you know, that are disadvantaged and people that need help, you show who your true character is, not by how you treat your peers, but how do you treat people that are having a struggle in life? Can I get a good amen? amen. And that's really kind of what makes fun, life fun, right? I mean, you know, go out and, oh, I helped a lot of people that were just like me. I had lunch with a lot of people that had got their act together. Well, you know, it's fun to go out and they that are whole need not the physician, but they that are sick, it's good to be able to help people that are in despair and hurting and we can be a blessing. Let's all pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray today, Father, in Jesus' name that you would help all of us. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to honor you in everything we do. We got an audience of one. And Lord, we realize that the old covenant is subordinate to a new covenant, but Lord, we see in the new covenant an emphasis and a demonstration of people who walked in a healthy fear of the Lord. And Lord, that's what I want. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else is that all of us in this room would live and keep short accounts with God and man. That, Lord, we would live in such a way, Father the God, that it, we're pleasing you in everything we do in terms of our deeds, our conduct. 
Praise God. I want everybody in this room, let's just thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses all of us today. Lord, thank you for the blood. Lord, thank you that 1 John 1 and 7 says, As we walk in the light, as you are in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you for the blood that cleanses us, Lord. Thank you for the blood that is cleansing us right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, not only do you put us in right standing, but Lord, you keep us there. You keep us washed in the blood of Jesus, Lord. Father, your word goes on to tell us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whenever we are conscious of those shortcomings and those sins, Lord, we stop and we pause and we say, Lord, just cleanse right now. Lord, we receive that cleansing, Lord. Thank you that you're doing it right now. In the name of Jesus, praise God.